time of genius and a time of bloodshed. A bastard child grew to manhood. He would be a servant of kings, a survivor in a land of assassins, and become an extraordinary legend of the Renaissance. He lived in a place where life was cheap and often squandered by cruelty and greed. Skilled in the mechanisms of war and the workings of power, he created timeless masterpieces, brilliant inventions, and lived through the times of strife to survive another day. Veiled in secrecy, marked by genius, and driven by his own code of survival and success, Leonardo da Vinci was a man for all seasons and a mystery for all the ages. Constantinople, the triple-walled and supposedly invincible capital of the Byzantine Empire. The beautiful city stood as a symbol of Roman glory and authority for more than a thousand years. But after a long and punishing siege, it finally fell to the Muslim Ottoman Turks in 1453. The Pope, Pius II, right after the fall of Constantinople, reminded everybody in letters he sent throughout Europe that this was a monumental event. The collapse of the mighty Byzantine Empire seemed to many to herald the end of civilization itself. But not so. Civilization was instead about to see a rebirth. With the old city, an old idea died, and a new one emerged and flew the ruins, eventually finding refuge to the west in the city-states of Italy. To the Byzantine mind, God was the center and meaning of everything. However, a revolutionary philosophy, humanism, which allowed for the study of man and new explorations into science, formed the basis of this new idea. It was a philosophy with the power to change the world. In studying God, we can study the theology and the philosophy of God. But in studying man, we can study biology, uh, zoology, anthropology, technology, sciences of all different types. Humanism transferred man's focus to man. In the city-states of Italy, humanism gave birth to a new age, the Renaissance, heralding an explosion of radical ideas, mind-bending inventions, and breathtaking discoveries. It was a time like no other in modern history. It's a nice time to be born as a, a really brilliant person. In the countryside between Pisa and Florence in Tuscany, a little boy was finding out about the world. From his earliest years, the mysteries of nature fascinated him. He grew up in the countryside outside of Florence, and he seems to have been able to find all kinds of animals and plants and insects. But the boy had no proper position in the world or prospects for a prosperous future. He was the bastard child of a respected notary and a poor farmer's daughter. He lived in his father's house while his mother was left to marry a man of her own class. His mother married sometime after Leonardo was born, uh, a local guy who is known through what seems to be a nickname, Attacabriga, the fighter, the quarreler, the guy with the fists. They probably lived locally. It's not, a, it's not inconceivable that Leonardo would have had some access to her, but it's equally possible that Leonardo's family kept him away from these other people who were of a different social station. As a child, Leonardo enjoyed a comfortable life with his father and stepmother, but because he was illegitimate, he didn't have much chance of success in life. It's sort of like a second-class family membership. Legal offspring, obviously, are going to inherit the family estate, as well as the, you know, follow the father into the family business. Uh, Leonardo is disqualified in some measure from that. Leonardo! Si, sí, madre! Torna a casa immediatamente. Ma perché devi sempre far di tutto un gioco? 
Destined for a career as a humble tradesman, he could not even take his father's name. Instead, he was known only as Leonardo from Vinci. His family spent no money at all on any formal education for him. You can sort of imagine what it must be like to have been uh, considered illegitimate in an age when being illegitimate really meant something. There were you know, professions that were closed to you. Um, you were really, you were constrained greatly by that, uh, by something completely beyond your control. Faced with the unavoidable problems associated with illegitimacy, young Leonardo began to develop a code, a philosophy of life, which was to push beyond all expectations and past all obstacles. It would eventually propel him into the corridors of power and on to greatness. In his teens, Leonardo moved with his father to Florence, a city driven in the later 1400s by perilous politics and dynamic culture. In this bustling place of commerce and beauty, one family stood at the very heart, a family whose importance to Leonardo would grow as he matured, the Medici. The Medicis are in charge of Florence because they were the bankers early on and they gained control of Florence and even though it was a republic and somebody should be voting for them, they controlled all the votes. The Medici were very rich and very influential. They were by far the most important and generous patrons of the arts in Florence. Yet in spite of their power, the Medici bankers could never sleep easy in their beds. Murder was common as other rival banking families competed with them for the city's business. And assassins were cheap. If you look at some of these paintings just of the, of the Renaissance leaders, they, they, they're wearing what looks like studs on their clothing. No, they're wearing cloth-covered armor. Mi pare se difficoltoso, come avevamo discusso. E allora onoratelo col vostro sigillo. They're scared to death that they're going to get knifed in the, in the streets. The Medici's keep a poisoner on staff at all times. I mean, what's going on? In a society governed by fear, suspicion bred a harsh form of justice. Any accusation, personal or political, could be lodged anonymously through the tamburo. This wooden box, in the shape of a drum, sat in front of the house of government, the Palazzo Vecchio. At one point, it threw a dark shadow over Leonardo's future. When a citizen lodged a charge, the authorities investigated it. Even the innocent were shamed by the accusation. The guilty were punished severely. Leonardo lived in a time and place where life was cheap, particularly for the lower classes. He knew he would have to break free of the stigma of being a bastard in order to gain a respectable position in society. In particular, this meant acceptance of membership into the guilds. Florence is a city that is, that is officially governed by the guilds. It's been that way since the end of the 13th century. The government of Florence is drawn from the most powerful guilds. The guilds were trade unions for artists and professionals. Most were closed to people who were illegitimate. It seems quite clear that he didn't have any kind of formal schooling, um, which would have been the norm uh, if he had been um, a legitimate child of, of his father rather than the illegitimate son that he was. Leonardo found it difficult even to gain entry to a lower non-professional guild. His only hope lay in his talent and the help of a well-placed friend of his father. Tu devi essere Leonardo. Ti stavo aspettando. Tuo padre pensa che hai del talento. In 1468, when Leonardo was 16, his father sent him to see Andrea del Verrocchio, a highly regarded Florentine artist who had a large studio. This is how you do things in Florence. You get referrals from your relations, your neighbors, your extended network of clients and friends. This kind of personal referral is how you would in a certain way break the practice of training your own son in your own line of work. 
Verrocchio agreed to take Leonardo on as an apprentice and to give him the experience he needed to one day gain admittance to a guild. Here, in Verrocchio's studio, which employed many craftsmen, Leonardo first came to understand the connection between art and power. The Medici, as the ruling family of Florence, often commissioned paintings from Verrocchio. Verrocchio was certainly the person you would think of in Florence towards the end of the 15th century. You know, if you want a painting, you go to Verrocchio. As Leonardo became a part of the workshop team, he realized that he could push beyond his social limitations. His code emerged even more strongly, convincing him that if circumstances hold you back, always find another way to achieve your goals. But outside the hive of creative industry in the studio, Florence was entering a highly dangerous period in its history. Even as the patriarch of the Medici family, Piero de' Medici, lay dying, his enemies were plotting to steal control of the family's fortune. Piero, ti senti un po' meglio? Solo la morte può ricarmi conforto adesso. All the wealth and prestige of the Medici could vanish instantly as plots against their lives were quietly prepared. At the moment Leonardo da Vinci arrived in Florence to establish a career, Florence itself was on the brink of violent disorder. The members of the ruling family of Florence gathered at the deathbed of their patriarch, Piero de' Medici. Great danger lay in wait for his son, Lorenzo, then only 20, as a rival family of bankers, the Pazzi, were plotting his immediate overthrow. Questa è la mia ultima volontà per te, Lorenzo. Devi guidare questa casata e guidare Firenze. Nessun altro può farlo. Devi stare attento, molto attento. The Pazzi and Medici problems were problems of business. We don't think the business might end up in murder. Uh, maybe not the business outside of, of the underworld or the Sopranos or something along those lines, but this is what was happening. If you were a leader, your life was in danger. <laughs> the Pazzi family hungered for the Medici money. They would do anything to seize it for themselves. <laughs> The young Leonardo was oblivious to the political storm clouds massing around Florence. Though he never met them, the Medici exerted a profound influence on his young life and ambitions. In the studio, Leonardo worked feverishly, his code driving him to learn all he could from his apprenticeship and to fulfill his teacher's expectations. His notebooks reflect the demands he made upon himself. The painter must develop all his skills because there is no self-respect in doing one thing well and another badly. The Verrocchio workshop is active in all kinds of media, uh, has command of technologies of, um, of different kinds, not just painting, but painting on ceramics, um, marble sculpture, sculpture in bronze, uh, other me metallurgical enterprises, um, like the casting of cannons, the casting of bells. Leonardo joined Verrocchio at a crucial time. The maestro was grappling with an enormous technological challenge. One of the things Leonardo would have seen in Verrocchio's workshop is the design and then the completion of a globe placed on top of one of the most important buildings in Florence, Saranno due tonnellate di rame dorato e deve essere bilanciato alla perfezione. Ma come, maestro? The construction of the two-ton globe and the engineering required to hoist it to the top of the Duomo rivaled the completion of Florence's grand cathedral dome itself. It was to be made of copper gilded with an amalgam of mercury. You couldn't call the riggers and have them come do it for you. You had to do it all yourself from memory with the skills you had learned. Uh, so he picked up 
an enormous amount of not only artistic training but practical engineering training uh, and mechanical training, just being part of the studio. Leonardo studied the Colla Granda, or Great Hoist, which was constructed to lift heavy objects to the top of the dome and also the swiveling crane at the summit. This early exposure to mechanical engineering had significant influence on his later inventions. In Verrocchio's studio, Leonardo saw how his talent and aptitude might allow him to escape the limitations of his origins. In 1471, he experienced the first taste of the world he aspired to. Verrocchio and his students were invited to bring their best work to the Medici Palace to prepare for a visit from the influential Duke of Milan. According to Giorgio Vasari, the 16th century biographer of the great painters, Leonardo had already distinguished himself. The greatest of all Verrocchio's pupils was Leonardo da Vinci, who, beside beauty and grace, had a power of intellect that whatever he turned his mind to made himself master of. Leonardo, portalo a me! In the palace, the young men observed how wealth and beauty came together in the homes of the very powerful. It was an object lesson for all of them. But the arrival of the Duke of Milan provided an even more telling inspiration for Leonardo. As the Duke, the patriarch of the Sforza family, paraded into Florence, Leonardo watched from the cheering crowds of onlookers. Like an outsider with no pedigree. And yet he had climbed to the pinnacle of power. The Schwarzes in Milan, they are actually the descendants of uh, condottieri, of mercenaries, who at a certain moment in time moved from being hired soldiers into actually marrying into the political uh, lineages and then actually coming into control of Milan. Leonardo could not help but be exhilarated. In the Duke, he saw a man who had overcome low birth and humble origins to achieve influence and success. To do the same, the young apprentice knew he must use every natural advantage he possessed. He was supposed to be extraordinarily handsome, very concerned about his looks, always dressed very well, supposed to be enormously strong. They said he could bend horseshoes with his bare hands. People just immediately liked him when they met him because he had this kind of um, undefinable quality to him that, that made people be attracted to him. And that's also a quality that is described in Leonardo's art. Though it was too early for Leonardo to foresee, his fate and future would hinge on the Sforza family, when he would employ charisma and talent to advance himself with them. In 1472, Leonardo was 20. He completed his apprenticeship and joined the guild as a painter, a huge step forward into the world of professional legitimacy and credentials. He was eligible to seek prestigious commissions of his own, but something held him back. Da Vinci stayed in Verrocchio's studio. Perhaps out of loyalty, perhaps he was still unsure of his abilities, but anyway, he stayed. The advantage there is he doesn't have to go out and set up by himself. There's every indication that Leonardo is temperamentally unsuited to opening his own shop. Usa un tocco leggerissimo qui Leonardo, leggerissimo. We can see a large number of commissions for paintings being at least in part turned over to the young Leonardo so that he's a serviceable, adaptable, younger partner in the firm. As he progressed, Leonardo's reputation grew until it eventually reached the ears of the Medici family. In the case of the Medicis and, and Leonardo, it appears though that they recognized very early on that this guy had great talent and he was going to exceed his mentor and exceed his fellow students and so they took a particular interest in him. In the studio, as Verrocchio's protégé, Leonardo's first great work was executed. It is considered to be the oldest surviving Leonardo painting. 
The angel on the left in the corner of Verrocchio's The Baptism of Christ is only a fragment, a tantalizing glimpse of the genius to come. It is only the mediocre pupil who does not surpass his master, Leonardo wrote. And legend has it that Verrocchio, after seeing Leonardo's angel, put down his brush and never painted again. These are all qualities that you can look at that painting today and you can see that's the hand of, of somebody else, some exceptional painter who really is not present in the rest of this painting. Leonardo had an incredible ability to see motion and to capture motion in his paintings. For example, the ringlets of hair, which have a kind of balance or spring. He was able to suggest that with paint uh, in a way that no one else really could. In Verrocchio's studio, his persistent experimentation with paint and techniques of painting set Leonardo apart. This commitment to experimentation became a vital component of his code. It was also a way to get ahead of his competitors, who were better educated and had the connections of good family. He recorded his thoughts in his notebooks. I know that I am not a man of letters. Experience is my one true mistress, and I will cite her in all cases. Only through experimentation can we truly know anything. Leonardo sets up this opposition between authority, which is transmitted through books, and people like himself, these maverick figures who operate outside normal professional boundaries who investigate, who take things apart, see what they're made, to see how they work. A man of exquisite sensitivity, Leonardo cherished every aspect of the natural world. He, unusually for the time, did not eat meat, refusing, as he said, to be a tomb for other creatures. To him, nature was the ultimate machine, and he held its mysteries in respect and awe. He spent his whole life trying to discover how nature worked, every aspect of it from the subtle movement of clouds and water to the majesty of birds in flight. Science, nature, mechanics, Leonardo pictured them as one entity to be understood and captured through the creative impulse. Nature is one thing, human nature something else. The success that lifted him above his bastard status also brought him envy and resentment. Dark forces began to move against him. Oblivious to the danger, Leonardo threw himself into new experiments to understand the nature of light and shadow. He examined the fall of candlelight on fabric and how the human eye records it. His notes reveal the importance he placed on these studies. Nothing can be recognized without light and shade. It is only through the eye, the window of the soul, that we can truly understand the complex workings of nature. He would have these casts made of draped fabric uh, and move the lights around, you know, set the candles in one position, look at the shadows, sketch it out, move nothing else but the light to somewhere else and then sketch the exact same piece of fabric again that you know, hasn't moved. The only thing that has changed is the interplay of light and shadow on it. In 1476, betrayal caught up with him. It was borne to his door by the Night Watch, the much dreaded and resented secret police force of Florence. Messer Leonardo da Vinci. Siamo delle guardie notturne. Siete accusato di crimini contro Dio. Dovete venire con noi. Leonardo had been anonymously accused of sodomy with a 17-year-old male prostitute. For repeat offenders, there could be um, prison terms and, and execution. Um, the official penalty for, uh, uh, for, for sodomy was burning, it was being to be burned to death. The humiliation was extreme. Nothing, he wrote, is to be feared so much as a damaged reputation. The fact is, it does affect him. 
He was a proud individual. He's a proud young man. He knows he's going someplace. And a charge like this could really have set back his career. But at the trial, no evidence was brought against him. No witnesses presented. The charges were dropped. It was the cruel act of a faceless and deceitful enemy. Dark days were just beginning in Florence. Political storm clouds gathered as forces moved against the Medici. Florence was almost surrounded by the territories ruled by the Pope. They extended south to the city-state of Naples and north to Ferrara. But all this wasn't enough for the avaricious Pope, Sixtus IV. He conspired to extend his reach into northern Italy and the lands held by the Medici. To break the Medici stronghold, Sixtus found an eager ally in a rival banker of Florence, Francesco dei Pazzi. Ed io, Francesco dei Pazzi, presterò a voi i soldi necessari ad estendere le terre papali. The Pope transferred his financial holdings into the coffers of the Pazzi family bank. But the Pazzi wanted more than the papal account. They wanted the Medici out of the way permanently. The Medicis needed money in their banking system. The Pazzi's needed money in their banking system. And when the two of them were vying for what little amount of money there was in Italy that was not already spoken for, that's when problems occurred, and that's when we get to violence. It was Easter, 1478. In celebration of the risen Christ, members of the Medici family took their seats in the cathedral for mass, directly across the aisle from the Pope's henchman, Francesco di Pazzi. They had no idea of the danger they were in. At a prearranged point in the service, the assault began. <laughs> Young Giuliano de' Medici was stabbed 19 times and bled to death on the cold marble of the cathedral floor. His older brother Lorenzo was wounded but somehow escaped. Having the Pope as their backer, the Pazzi assassins thought they would succeed with their plot. They were quite wrong. The Medici supporters quickly rally and the Patsy uprising is put down with extraordinary violence. Lorenzo's response was swift and merciless. We get a sense of the Medici's power in the outcome of the murder, the immediate retribution. There was no rights for the criminals. They were dispensed with and they were dispensed with in a very public manner. That very day, Francesco di Pazzi was hanged alongside his co-conspirator, the Archbishop of Pisa. They drag his body around, they chop it to pieces, humiliated in all kinds of ways. This is familiar in ways that we find hard to imagine. But this was not the end. One assassin had managed to escape. Weeks later, Bernardo Barancelli, the murder of Giuliano, Lorenzo's brother, was finally captured and hanged in front of an enthusiastic crowd. Leonardo da Vinci was there. Then two messengers rode to Florence, carrying an unsettling message. The Pope had excommunicated Lorenzo de' Medici in retribution for executing the Archbishop of Pisa. He had also dispatched the army of Naples to force Lorenzo into surrender. This is a big army. This is something that is going to be difficult to defeat. And difficult to defeat without a huge amount of economic loss and loss of lives and societal upheaval.
the Republic of Florence confronted its own annihilation. Here, in all its terrible glory, we see the most potent of the Renaissance arts, the art of war. In the terrible aftermath, it was obvious to Lorenzo that the city's plight was desperate. His troops were being cut to ribbons and civilians were dying of wounds and hunger. He had to find a way to end the war and save Florence from destruction. It seemed the larger political landscape might provide Lorenzo with a solution to his problem. The Muslim Ottoman Empire, greatly feared by Christian Europeans, had threatened the entire peninsula of Italy for some time. Florence, Naples and the Papal States were all at risk. In an audacious and extremely hazardous move, Lorenzo travelled south to confront King Ferdinand of Naples face to face. It was an attempt to convince Ferdinand that the Italian states should unite against the Turks rather than fight each other. If he should fail in his mission, Florence as an independent republic was doomed. Se una bombarda colpisce a segno in linea diritta a dieci braccia. The risk was significant. He could have died, he could have been taken hostage. While he was gone, he could have been replaced by usurpers. Intrigued, but unconvinced, the king had him arrested while he considered the proposal. At home in Florence, Leonardo da Vinci, like everyone else, was caught up in the tension and anxiety of impending war. He began to design ladders and other devices for defending and scaling walls. These ladders are designed to carry two men. They are also useful for a tower, where you might fear that a rope ladder could be detached by the enemy. It's all engineering, 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 because that's sort of the reality of Italy at the time that Leonardo's alive. You have all these different warring city-states, uh, and warfare is a you know, constant fact of life. Leonardo labored on patiently, putting his intelligence and curiosity to work on defensive fortifications and weapons of war. Three whole months passed with no word of Lorenzo de' Medici. In the streets of Florence, the citizens waited anxiously. The air was thick with tension as the weeks dragged by without any news of their leader or their own fate. The people went about their business despondently as hope dwindled. The Medici dynasty and Florentine independence appeared doomed. They knew what their situation was. When Lorenzo's in the camp of an opponent, they must have been nervous. He could lose his wealth. He could lose the city. The Florentines could lose the city. And then, a commotion rippled through the streets. It was Lorenzo returning in triumph having persuaded King Ferdinand of Naples to end the war. The crowd celebrated his courage and statesmanship with real affection. Lorenzo the Magnificent had pulled Florence back from the brink of disaster and everyone was safe. As peace returned to the relieved city, Leonardo received a commission to paint the Adoration of the Magi as an altarpiece for the monastery at San Donato a Scopeto. It was his first important work as a painter in his own right. We have the Adoration of the Magi treated like nobody has really conceived this event before. Among the turmoil of figures that are surrounding the kind of serene virgin and child, this frenzy of devotional attention, there are rearing horses. It's a turmoil of men and horses. The composition is unusual, being almost square, 
within which is a triangle made up of the Virgin and the Kneeling Magi. But here, Leonardo is using the body of the horse to invest his composition with dynamic motion and energy, the sense of frenzy, the sense that this is almost like an apocalyptic event in the Incarnation. Intriguingly, some art historians think the standing figure of the young man at the bottom right may be a self-portrait of the young Leonardo. The work is considered an overture, the first indication of great things to come. But it didn't turn out well. After devoting an extraordinary amount of time to the underpainting, he left the work unfinished. His notebooks suggest a reason. To conceive an idea is noble. To execute the work is servile. Somebody who's intensely curious, uh, restless, doesn't like to stay at one thing. The point at which something's ready to be finished is the point at which it's no longer interesting. He was much more interested in the natural world, in the mechanical world, and only painted uh, occasional paintings when he seems to have had a cash flow problem. It wasn't a good time for Leonardo to abandon the painting. Lorenzo de Medici was considering artists for a plum assignment, a trip to Rome to decorate the Pope's Sistine Chapel. It was the kind of commission that a young artist like Leonardo could only dream of, a real chance to shine before the most discerning patrons in Italy. Lorenzo's choice would affect Leonardo's future and shape his destiny for better or for worse. Even as news of Leonardo da Vinci's talent spread through the sophisticated patrons of Florence, he appears to have lost interest in painting. An important commission was left unfinished. Clients grew angry. And when Lorenzo the Magnificent chose his finest artist to send to Rome, Leonardo was not selected. The Adoration of the Magi is one of the great masterpieces of the High Renaissance, and yet Leonardo was unable to finish it, and some believe that he had conceptualized the end of the painting in his mind, and that was enough for him, rather than actually going to the brush and doing it physically. And so, he found himself in lawsuits a number of times because he couldn't finish his work. He cannot deal with the ordinary conditions of production, of clientage, uh, of contract, supplying works to deadline uh, according to a patron's specifications. He didn't finish anything. Psychologists today have names for these things. Perhaps he was ADD. Perhaps he was obsessive compulsive. Maybe he was anxious. Maybe he was depressed. We don't know exactly what his male ailment was, but there seemed to be something afflicting his mind. It seems that Leonardo's greatest gifts, his restless imagination and endless stream of ideas, complicated his life in general and his drive for success in particular. Also, circumstances frequently held him back, making him constantly change his plans and rearrange his objectives. You're not really sure he wanted to be an artist. That was his inroads into the court life and into the patronage life. Uh, but when he gets there, he almost kind of leaves it behind. Dissatisfied with painting, da Vinci decided it was time for a change. His code demanded that he find another channel for his ambition and energy. He needed a fresh start and new opportunities. And so, in 1482, he went to Milan. As the most northern of the Italian states, Milan was the most vulnerable to foreign invasion. So it was heavily armed and a center for weapons production and military technology. As he wandered through the armorer's stalls in the bustling streets of Milan, da Vinci perceived a vibrant city always on the brink of battle and always ready to defend itself, not just from rival Italian city-states, but from the overarching aggression of France. 
In the tools of war, large and small, Leonardo saw a future for himself he could not realize in Florence. Italy is a theater of war as local powers call in the bigger powers of Europe with disastrous results. In the Ducal Palace in Milan, a letter arrived. Carefully worded and boastful in tone, it presented to the acting ruler, Ludovico Svorza, the credentials of Leonardo da Vinci, not as an artist, but as a genius of military engineering. I have plans for extremely light and strong bridges, adapted to be most easily carried. I have plans for making mortars, easy to transport and able to fling small stones, almost resembling a storm, and creating smoke terrifying to the enemy. Where a bombardment of cannon might fail, I can make catapults and other machines of marvelous accuracy and not in common use. Da Vinci's designs were visionary. His covered assault car was an improvement on an earlier well-known idea, but it will take 400 years before the concept is actually realized as the modern tank of the First World War. Leonardo describes the machine in his notes. I will make covered chariots, which will be impervious to any body of men-at-arms who try to shatter it when attacking the enemy with artillery. The truly innovative quality was mobility. Hand-cranked by men or horse-powered, the cranks attached to horizontal wheels geared to the four driving wheels. Closer examination shows that da Vinci's design as drawn would have the drive wheels turning in opposite directions. Was this an error or a stratagem to confuse an enemy that might want to steal his design? We have a repertory of drawings uh, made by Leonardo showing savage looking uh, instruments of warfare chariots with sides that you know slash through the flesh of an enemy army it improves on the old idea of the roman chariot by adding an upright lantern gear with four huge scythe blades mounted above like a helicopter with curved blades da vinci's design for a cannon shows hundreds of swarming bodies dwarfed by the colossal bronze gun the drawing exemplifies one of Leonardo's enduring obsessions. He loved scale. Um, he loved to speculate and, and dream about things on a scale just vastly beyond that of the period. So he has these gigantic speculative designs for incredible killing machines. Da Vinci's fantastical weapon designs demonstrate his continual striving to transcend the ordinary, always dreaming in an extreme landscape of life and death. In his real life, it becomes a pattern, a part of his code. He believes that we must never be limited by what has been done before or what others might think of us. He certainly sells himself as somebody who has secrets, somebody who knows the technology of military engineering, making guns, making weapons. Leonardo hoped that Ludovico Svorza, the regent of Milan, would commission him to build these war machines. Ludovico Sforza is the brother of the assassinated Duke of Milan. He's acting as the regent, basically the effective ruler of Milan. And he's basically controlling the defense policy, the foreign policy of the Milanese state. Ludovico would hold power only until his timid nephew Gian Galeazzo came of age, if he ever did. Touché. Adesso vai pure. Ho degli affari da sbrigare. I think everybody expects that the one thing that Ludovico really wants is the Dukedom of Milan. Uh, he's prepared to go to extraordinary lengths to get it. But the armies of rulers and the cruel uncertainty of politics will overturn Ludovico Sforza's dreams of glory and with them everything that Leonardo da Vinci has yearned for.
After leaving Florence, Leonardo da Vinci arrived in Milan hoping to sell his skill as a military engineer to the acting duke Ludovico Sforza, a shrewd and ambitious aristocrat and warlord. He walked away from what would have no doubt been a secure and comfortable living as the society painter in late 15th century Florence. He went instead to the bustling but military, aggressive, politically turbulent city of Milan, up near the French border. At the end of the 15th century, Italy was a place, but not a nation. It was a war zone, as the smaller city-states of Milan and Naples struggled to survive against the superpowers of France and the Ottoman Empire, pressing in from both sides. Cleverly exploiting the unstable political climate, Leonardo's letter to the Duke outlined every imaginable military skill he had as an engineer and expert in fortress design, cannon construction and siege machines. Only in the very last sentence did he mention that he was also a painter. Unfortunately, Leonardo had to postpone his excitement about designs of war. The Duke needed a portrait of his mistress. Despite Leonardo's disappointment, the painting became one of his most famous and most important. The Lady with an Ermine. It was revolutionary. The first time a portrait showed the sitter's innermost thoughts and feelings entirely through posture, gesture and expression. This relates to a series of interests being pursued by Leonardo about the motions of the mind. You know, as the mind moves, so the body expresses the motions of the mind. Or as Leonardo would say, that's where the movements of the soul make themselves most manifest. Her head is turned to the right, as if distracted by something to the side. The animal is also tense and alert. In this picture, we see da Vinci's code pushing him to explore radical new ideas. He's almost obsessive in his quest to want to know as much as possible about what he's interested in while he's interested in it. Sforza, the grandson of a mercenary, and da Vinci, the bastard son of a notary, depended on each other to raise their prospects and standing in society. Guardate da questa parte adesso, signorina Gallerani. È un piacere posare per voi. This was not what he came to Milan for, but Leonardo was experienced enough to know that power and opportunity are always bedfellows. And the enormous Sforza ego soon gave him the opportunity. The Duke commissioned a colossal statue of his father astride a powerful stallion. So Leonardo began to study the proportions of horses using a small and docile model as his subject. The distance between one ear and the other should equal the length of one of the ears. The length of the ear should equal a fourth of the face. Ludovico Sforza wanted a statue larger than any other, the biggest equestrian monument ever executed. It's often held that these warlord princes used art as a means of making themselves look more permanent, more legitimate, more established than perhaps they were in practice. The sports have only been around from 1450, but their equestrian monument is going to outdo all others that exist. Leonardo considered the challenge of creating the 24-foot high statue a career-making opportunity, as well as a triumph of art and technology to endure through the ages. In the end, he devoted over a dozen years of his life to the project. It was going to be a statue on a scale so much larger than anything that had come before it that it required all kinds of new technologies to figure out how to make this thing. Extending his vision and skill to the utmost, Leonardo made countless smaller clay models and devoted the next several years to working out how to cast the Colossus in 60 tons of bronze. Because he wanted to cast the horse in particular as one piece, this would have been cast upside down, he had to dig casting pits. Well, Milan is built in a river valley and there is a water table down there. 
the head of the horse pointing downward would have been just about at the level of the water table. And if you in fact start heating up uh, the water table in an area, you will create some very serious problems, possibly even an explosion. So in other words, he was working very close to the limits of the possible. This example shows the very essence of Leonardo's code, to soar far beyond the expected and the predictable, not only in his work, but also in his life. And as the great horse slowly took shape, Leonardo turned his curiosity again to weapons of war. Like the horse, his designs were huge, monumental. He always engineers these things that are just enormous, much, much larger than anything that existed at the time. And uh, the giant crossbow is sort of the, the poster child of this, this mentality. Uh, it's about the size probably of a tractor trailer uh, in length. The construction was highly advanced with the bow to be built of laminated sections to give the greatest strength and flexibility. The bowstring, drawn back by a worm gear, could be fired silently. People look at Leonardo's drawings of things like the giant crossbow, and they seem to think that this is an original idea. It isn't. What Leonardo is doing is taking an idea that's fairly commonplace and seeing how far he can push it. Leonardo started writing his famous notebooks, it became an obsession that lasted his entire lifetime and confounds us to this day. It is estimated that he filled over 15,000 pages with notes before he died. What did he write in his notebooks? Everything. Laundry lists. Don't forget to get the money that so-and-so owes you. I need this at the store. Moving lists. Uh, sketches of people that he saw on the street who had interesting faces. Notes to himself of you know, anything he wanted to remember. Leonardo often composed these notes from right to left, even forming the letters and words backwards sometimes, as in a mirror image. People would you know, speculate, and still speculate, you know, that he was trying to write in code, he didn't want people copying his ideas, maybe he was saying things that he didn't want people to be able to read. But the most likely reason is simply that he learned to write as a left-handed child, and so composing left to right and even writing backwards came naturally to him. By this time, Leonardo had taken an assistant. His name was Giacomo, a young working-class lad with only limited prospects in life. He helped Leonardo build the many mechanical contraptions and novelties for Ludovico Sforza's elaborate parties. Giacomo, perché devi sempre giocare con tutto? E dammi quel pianeta! Da Vinci called him Salai, meaning little devil. The cheeky but loyal lad stayed with Leonardo for the rest of the artist's life. <laughs> and Salai's name appeared in the notebooks more than any other. Salai was with him on one of the most important days in the artist's life. Ludovico staged an extravagant family celebration which featured Leonardo's colossal clay model of the Duke's horse, unveiling it for the first time before his noble friends and political associates. The Swartza horse was supposed to be uh, the largest cast statue in the world that was going to, uh, you know, sort of trumpet the glories of the house of Sforza and also probably secure Leonardo a lifetime uh, position in the court there. The party, like da Vinci's horse, was a celebration of Ludovico's power and influence. The guests, as well as his beautiful wife Beatrice d'Este, included his nephew, the real Duke, Gian Galeazzo, who was 25. It's become quite apparent that young Galeazzo Sforza has been sidelined by Ludovico, his uncle, who really has designs on the duchy for himself. Gian Galeazzo never assumed power. Within the year, he was dead, some say poisoned, making Ludovico the ruling Duke of Milan at last, 
With nothing remaining in the way to curb his ambition, he would set Milan and Leonardo on the road to war. Siamo pronti, Leonardo! In the end, the party was all about status, influence, the magnificent Da Vinci horse, and Ludovico's dangerous ambitions. In 1494, as the new Duke of Milan, Sforza joined forces with France. Together, the powerful allies invaded the Italian city-state of Naples. It was a risky strategy. Leonardo's plans for the great horse in jeopardy. It came down to the necessities of the day, uh, being that there was very little metal, and uh, the Duke of Milan had the choice of casting cannon or giving this metal to Leonardo to make a statue. He chose to, you know, do the expedient thing and actually look to his own defense. With war on the horizon, the 60 tons of bronze set aside for da Vinci's great horse was melted in the furnaces of Milan and poured into cannon molds. Leonardo remained stoic. As His Excellency's mind is occupied elsewhere, the arts are put to silence. Of the horse I will say nothing, because I know the times. The Duke, still eager to establish an illustrious legacy for the Sforza name, gave da Vinci a new commission, a fresco for the court church Santa Maria della Grazia, to be adorned with his family's coat of arms. The painting would become one of the great masterpieces of the Renaissance. But to the priest's consternation, years passed with no sign of completion. Maestro Leonardo, quando pensate sarà finito? Ho solo bisogno di mettere una faccia a Giuda. No, fermo lì. La vostra sembianza sarà perfetta. <laughs> Leonardo spent more than three difficult years on the painting, which is a complex and beautiful rendering of Christ's final meal with the apostles. The Last Supper was revolutionary for its time. It captured the dramatic moment when Jesus told his apostles, one of you will betray me. In his writings, Leonardo describes how the gestures and faces of the apostles are executed in order to convey intense distress. One twists the fingers of his hands together and turns a grim face to his master. Another, with hands outspread, showing the palms, shrugs his shoulders. Da Vinci's attention to human response reveals his obsession with science. He mastered anatomy, he was a master of geometry, he mastered perspective, and by utilizing all these sciences, Leonardo could uh, create an art that was scientific in a way. Painting was a source of knowledge, just as geometry was a source of knowledge. But in The Last Supper, Leonardo's experimenting was disastrous as he explored the properties of his paints incorporating oil, which proved incompatible with the plaster base. So he decides he's going to try a new technique at uh, drying the, the fresco. And it doesn't work. In fact, it destroys much of, the, of what he has labored to do. Within a few years, damp in the wall began to penetrate the plaster and crack the oil-based paint. But Leonardo would not be there to see it happen. The political wind changed direction. Sforza's former ally, France, abruptly invaded Milan. Da Vinci lost his patron and his job together in one fell stroke. His notes reflect this sudden reversal of fortune. The Duke has lost his state, his property, and his freedom. None of our great enterprises will come to pass. 
the occupying French army, bent on annihilating all evidence of the Sforzas, used da Vinci's epic sculpture for target practice. It was a symbolic act. It shows how closely these equestrian monuments were identified with the power of a certain ruler. Then secondary, it was a great work of art, but first of all, it was a symbol. Da Vinci learned in this cruel act how fleeting his success might be and how vulnerable he was to the fickleness of politics. Saddened by the loss of the great horse, an aging Leonardo quit Milan with his faithful apprentice, Salai. All his work had to be left behind. The shattered horse, the last supper, all were abandoned. With the fall of the House of Sforza in Milan, Leonardo was out of a job, and there began a period of his life where he wandered about. His notebooks reflect his philosophical state of mind. Patience protects against misfortune as warm clothes protect against the cold. The warmer you dress, the more powerless the storm. In the same way, increasing your patience in the face of great wrongs renders them powerless against your peace of mind. His travels took him to Venice, at that point menaced by the growing power of the Ottoman Turks to the east. Perhaps there he would find a market for his innovative weapons and fortifications. One of the interesting things is considering how much of his career he spent not working as an artist. Um, if he, you know, he's always thought about first and foremost as a painter, um, but if you look at the number of years he was employed by various, by various patrons, um, a big chunk of it was spent at largely as a military engineer and as an entertainer. Leonardo approached the Doge, the ruler of Venice, with a variety of dazzling ideas, even a diving suit and snorkel system for underwater warfare. In his notebooks, da Vinci describes this ingenious but complex design. A breastplate of armor with hood, doublet and hose, and the wineskin to hold the breath, with half a hoop of iron to keep it clear of the chest. When you deflate the wineskin, you will go to the bottom pulled down by sacks of sand. When you inflate it, you will rise to the surface. He seems sometimes almost not to really belong to his age in a day when you know, they didn't even have mundane things like regular ways of keeping time. Um, you know, Leonardo is thinking about walking on the bottom of the ocean and flying in the air with the birds uh, and developing self-propelled vehicles. He just has such a, such a completely singular vision of pretty much everything around him. Da Vinci's ideas were centuries ahead of his time. His code led him to dream the impossible. But Venice had no interest in his inventions. He was considered a foreigner, and his visionary ideas met only with suspicion and mistrust. Rejected, he realized he'd have to pursue his dreams elsewhere. In 1501, he went back to Florence, where he grew up. It had long since come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely sit back and let things happen to them. They go out and make things happen. But da Vinci's confidence was soon challenged. The Florence of his youth had changed. Though he was still recognized as a great artist, someone new and considerably younger had captured the city's febrile imagination. His name was Michelangelo Buonarroti, a brash young artist of only 26 whose talent was truly mercurial. Leonardo hated him. Artists of the Renaissance were extremely competitive with each other and with themselves. Rough, Disheveled, arrogant and subversive, Michelangelo defied Leonardo's expectations of the court artist. In his notes, da Vinci voices his disgust. The sculptor's face is covered with paste and all powdered with marble dust so that he resembles a baker. 
His house is dirty and filled with chips and dust of stone. With the painter, it is just the opposite. Well-dressed, sitting easily in front of his work and moving a very light brush. His home is filled with music, unspoiled by the pounding of hammers. The simmering hostility between Leonardo and Michelangelo quickly became public. One day, as Michelangelo approached him on a busy street, Leonardo offered a question about the writer Dante to the sculptor as he passed. Chiedi a Michelangelo. Lui ha letto Dante. Spiegatelo da solo. E già che ci sei, spiega come ha imbrogliato la gente di Milano con il tuo impossibile cavallo. Stung by the insult and cruelly reminded of his failure, Da Vinci was bitter. He continued to mock Michelangelo's work. I think I'm quoting him accurately when he criticized uh, painters like Michelangelo, for, whose anatomy, he said, made people look as if they were bags full of walnuts. Almost 25 years older than Michelangelo, Leonardo was dispirited, packing up his paints each night with less enthusiasm than the night before. His writing reflects his growing despair at the approach of old age. Oh, time, devourer of all things. Oh, spiteful age, how you destroy and consume everything with the relentless teeth of years, little by little in a slow death. In his dejection, Leonardo found an opportunity in one of the most unlikely of patrons, a man whose treachery surpassed all others even in that violent era. His name was Cesare Borgia, and he was intent on cutting a bloody path to power straight through the heart of Italy. Having lost the work of 17 years, a disheartened Leonardo da Vinci eventually returned to Florence, only to find himself challenged by a much younger rival, the great artist Michelangelo. His notebooks reveal that even in the face of all this, his code demands that he persevere. Obstacles cannot crush me. Every obstacle must yield to stern resolve. He whose gaze is fixed on a distant star will not falter. In 1502, da Vinci found an unlikely patron in Pope Alexander VI and his bastard son, one of the most dreaded and dreadful tyrants of the age, Cesare Borgia, Duke of Romagna. Cesare is accused at least of murdering one or two of his sister's husbands and lovers, and maybe his own brother. Cesare himself has, is portrayed by uh, some as being the devil incarnate, by others as being this great, great leader. Cesare personifies the corruption and lust for power that has come to represent the Borgia papacy. He was utterly ruthless in his attempt to consolidate his father's empire, hoping one day to claim it for himself. One by one, the cities of Romagna his papal army. Hungrily, he set his mark on an ever-widening area. But in order to finally succeed, he needed an edge, someone with new ideas. He turned to Leonardo da Vinci. Ecco le vostre carte. È un onore servirla. He was given the title of Chief General Engineer by Borgia. And so Leonardo probably had a chance to observe the real horrors of war firsthand. The rural villages of northern Italy became Borgia's slaughterhouse as his mercenary armies moved to expand the territory of his father, Pope Alexander VI. Borgia has been described as one of the cruelest men in Italian history. And in fact, Borgia was the subject of Machiavelli's book, The Prince, as the model warlord who could achieve this unification of Italy. The death of innocent peasants meant nothing to Cesare Borgia as he plundered whatever he desired. He made a reputation for himself as a man of extraordinary cruelty. 
He was pragmatic, intelligent, and deadly. Da Vinci served his patron well, supervising the building of defensive works, towers, trenches, and weaponry. He was finally given the opportunity to pursue military designs and to practice the art of war. For Borgia, Leonardo's greatest usefulness lay in his unique bird's eye view maps, which were a clever key to rapid success on the battlefield. By handing these maps to Borgia, Leonardo was enabling this warlord to run his troops through the night and arrive ahead of time at the battle and have a chance to win. And so the relationship between Leonardo and warfare is very complex. Da Vinci and the ruthless Borgia worked well together. Each had a complex mind. Each was actively ambitious. In the mechanics of war and the subtleties of power broking, Leonardo excelled. This may be one of the things that Leonardo is never given credit for. He seems to know the political winds and he seems to, to blow quite nicely with them. And he fits in very well with uh, Cesare. Although Borgia's savagery was well known to Leonardo, the violence suddenly became more personal when Borgia ordered the execution of three captains. One of them, Vitellozzo Vitelli, was his friend. The artist was appalled. His writings reflect a growing disquiet. Truly man is more savage than beast, for our brutality exceeds theirs. We live by the death of others. He finally decides that even animals, they kill for a reason. Human beings, they just, it becomes part of their nature just to kill. Da Vinci left the service of Cesare Borgia and returned to Florence and the life of a painter perhaps to explore the gentler side of human nature. There he began the one single work for which he will always be remembered. No, no, non ridete. Sorridete. È divertente, ma non isterico. Pensate cose dolci. Pensate al vostro amante. Giusto. It is called the Mona Lisa. No one knows who she is, or even if she existed at all. As he painted her, Leonardo kept her amused with music and entertainment. Leonardo says in his writings that faces are most beautiful at dusk. He captured orange films of paint, a technique which is later called sfumato, which means a kind of literally smoking, a kind of a smoky effect. You can see it in these almost invisible transitions from light to shade, which are so enigmatic and so incredible that anybody could paint that with brushes. It's really a great display of virtuosity. People often talk about the Mona Lisa smile as being mysterious. If it is mysterious, it's because Leonardo da Vinci has uh, shaded the corners of her mouth and eyes, which are some of the most expressive features of the human face. is to suggest that the Mona Lisa is a painting of a mystery. That there's something very, very secret going on with the Mona Lisa. And this is, we get the elaboration of this myth of secrecy about the Mona Lisa's smile. Or who is the Mona Lisa? You know, is she Leonardo's lover? Is she Leonardo himself? History doesn't... Da Vinci's biographer Giorgio Vasari identifies her as Mona Lisa Gioconda, the wife of a merchant. But Vasari wrote his Lives of the Artists in 1550 and never saw the painting, and Da Vinci himself never left us any clues. Carried it around with him for years, and he kept working on it. Never quite done. The only reason it exists in the form it exists today is because he died. The Mona Lisa remains forever a work in progress, a physical manifestation of the artist's code of his commitment to achieve the impossible, perfection in painting.
Never satisfied, Leonardo's restless mind continued to ponder the natural world around him. One of his abiding obsessions was the enigma of flight. I mean, in a, in a day when there is no stop motion photography, he was able to look at birds in flight and actually see that birds don't just flap their wings up and down. It's a very complicated sort of figure eight motion of the bird's wing tilting and coming up and turning and pushing down. Leonardo used his knowledge of engineering to design machines that he hoped would be capable of flight, and he made an audacious prediction. There shall be wings for man. If it is not accomplished by me, then it will be some day by some other. He adapted a child's spinning toy into a design for a hovering apparatus, using a helical screw rather than a rotor, as modern helicopters do. He created bat-winged flying machines. They had an intricate framework and wings that would flap like a bird's. One even included a rudder-like flight control. There is a legend that he tried to actually fly a machine and that the machine crashed and someone broke a leg in this attempt. Leonardo's machines, um, in, in the way that fantastic is fantasy, maybe they didn't work, but they mean so much as far as the mind is concerned. As far as his actual ability to think beyond the box. But he seems to have, have realized that the amount of power necessary to make one of his you know, six foot long wings flap was more than a person could provide. Uh, so then he starts getting into more complicated designs that actually involve um, motors of some sort so that you can get them to flap for a while before the motor stops. Only late in life did he consider the idea of a single fixed wing, the idea that eventually would lead to successful manned flight hundreds of years later. Despite all his striving and his extraordinary designs, he never succeeded in mastering manned flight. However, for the entirety of his life, he never stopped trying. He's a brilliant man, he's a brilliant engineer as far as the theory is concerned. But maybe the practice, maybe the practical part of things, uh, the practical part of engineering, which so often eludes these great thinkers, also eluded him. Despite Leonardo's frustrations with engineering, it is with a far more complicated machine that he achieved his most remarkable success. With a moment of death, led him to understand the workings of the human body itself. Leonardo da Vinci, at the age of 53, had been working on the most well-known and celebrated masterpiece of all time, the Mona Lisa. He continued to work on it and keep it with him until the day he died. His obsession with both artistic perfection and technical Leonardo in a surprising direction. He turned his insatiable curiosity to the study of life's great the human body. He was interested in anatomy from an early age, probably from his time in Verrocchio's workshop, where artists in Florence were encouraged either to perform dissections, autopsies at a medical school, for example, or they were encouraged, if not to perform them, then at least to observe them. Always fascinated with the human body, he studied the mysteries of death at the hospital of Santa Maria Novella. Dicono che abbiate vissuto cento anni. È vero? Cento anni non è così difficile. Non sento dolori. Solo stanco. Tanto stanco. E terribilmente debole. He's interested in the way that the pieces of the 
very intricate mechanism, the way the pieces of this mechanism fit together. Within hours of the old man's death, da Vinci descended into the cavernous morgue to take his body apart. Those uh, dissection of human corpses wasn't frowned on by the, the church of his time. That seems, though, to be more of a modern concept and modern prescription. Down in the morgue, he made an astonishing discovery, centuries ahead of its time. I conducted an autopsy in order to determine the cause of such a peaceful death and found that it was caused by the failure of blood flowing to the heart and other lower members, which I found withered and shrunk. In 1507, Leonardo made history's first description of arteriosclerosis by comparing the circulatory system of the old man with that of a child. And we have to try to imagine 500 years ago what it would have been like to work on an autopsy without the benefit of good lighting or good uh, preservation of the material. The smell must have been awful. Despite the difficulties presented by such conditions, Leonardo invented an entirely new way of seeing. Later, his cross-sections and exploded diagrams will profoundly visualizing anatomy and machinery. His code, like the man himself, became rounded and mature. Experimentation continued to be the primary engine in his effort to achieve what no one else had. I am inspired by the urgency of doing. We must act on it. Being willing is not enough. We must do. Leonardo's notebooks reveal the vast scope of his visionary ideas, and yet he never published so much as a single page of them. Often in his notes you'll see him uh, talking about, I'm going to you know, do a book on this subject that will lay out this, 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 and this. There was always you know, a little bit more you could do. There was one more observation you could make, and you know, time caught up with him. As Leonardo descended into old age, his legacy became a casual bundle of documents, a lifetime of genius written onto thousands of pieces of fragile paper, including the only image we have of the man himself. There is one image of an old man that's commonly attributed as being a self-portrait, but we don't know. It's completely untitled. It's just a, a sketch among you know, millions of other sketches that he did. What I think is interesting is the extent to which that Leonardo is completely lost to us. Francis I of France, a great admirer of Leonardo and collector of his work, invited the artist and his two assistants, Salai and Francesco Melzi, Leonardo got his last job, which is essentially being court genius to the King of France. He didn't really have much in the way of responsibilities. The King of France just wanted him as an ornament. The King named Leonardo da Vinci his favorite painter, engineer, and architect. Si sta facendo tardi, maestro. Possiamo continuarlo nel mattino. Francesco Dio lo aiuteremo a mettersi a letto. But at 65, Leonardo's triumphs were had paralyzed his right arm, and his left hand could no longer paint fine details. He doesn't seem to have had any obligations. Leonardo doesn't seem to have done much in those last few years, except for enjoy life. And uh, he did enjoy life. It was the high part of a, a very well-deserved retirement, I suppose. Salai, the boy Leonardo had taken on so many years before, was still with him and Melzi had become his student and most trusted companion. So Leonardo, at the time, he has with him uh, the Mona Lisa, a couple of other paintings, all of which he, he um, bequeaths to Melzi, who is his apprentice and had been traveling with him for years and years. In 1519, after months of failing health, Leonardo da Vinci passed gently into history and into legend. 
I think Leonardo is one of these individuals who had a code of, of success. He didn't measure it in degrees of wealth. He didn't measure it in degrees of popularity. He measured it in how he felt about his own achievements. To me, Leonardo da Vinci represents something about human beings themselves. He represents uh, someone who overcame a number of social obstacles and really does show what we're capable of. His ability to see far beyond his present day reality is I think one of the things that makes him eternally popular. We have a body of writing, we have a trail of documents, but Leonardo, it's a complicated mosaic. Painting was a source of knowledge. To Leonardo da Vinci, painting was a science. He can inspire all of us today, regardless of who we are, to try to make the most of our lives as we can. Leonardo da Vinci's genius catapulted him out of obscurity and into the bright light of celebrity in the courts of kings. By refusing to compromise his own intellectual code or be crushed by adversity, he became the most important man of his age. And now he is 